Hello and welcome back to the Port to Port podcast. This is Gordon Rennie, your host, and this is episode two. This week I'm delighted to say that we're joined by John Loken from Cordex. Now if you've not heard of Cordex, it's probably time that you did some research. Cordex are an exciting marine startup based in Singapore, and they've probably had one of the toughest first years in terms of market conditions that any startup could ever face. But I'm delighted to say that they've went from strength to strength, and the day after... I think it was the day after we recorded the podcast, they had a, a, a massive contract signed. But never mind listening to me, let's hear from John himself. John, obviously, I, we've done an introduction there, but if you don't mind, if you would be so kind to, you would do a far better job than me if you can introduce yourself and tell us who you are. Thank you for inviting me along today, uh, Gordon, and uh, letting me uh, have a chat with you. So, yeah, um, I started off as... Um, uh, yeah, you know, growing up in a town that had uh, old shipping routes, and it was actually the, the the biggest hometown of the Norwegian fleet in the 1870s. But I never thought of joining any maritime industry or having a career in the maritime at all. Uh, I thought, you know, that's uh, I didn't even have, it didn't even come to my mind. So I set out on a career in uh, in the hospitality industry. And I went to Birmingham and studied uh, hotel business management. Oh, thought, right. That's going to be my that's going to be my career. I'm going to work in hotels, and that's uh, definitely what I'm cut out for. And then, as soon as I left uni, I n- <laughs> never set foot in a hotel again as an employee, at least. <laughs> I certainly spent a few nights uh, staying in hotels and enjoying it, but. <laughs> That was uh, the end of working there. So I, um, because when I left uh, uh, university, I had the, the good opportunity of uh, joining the British Embassy in Oslo, right. and working with particularly the maritime industry at the trade section there. And that was such a wonderful opportunity and um, really introduced me to an industry that I found most fascinating and interesting. So yes. that was the beginning, and it was it was uh, such a varied role as well because we we worked with uh, you know as trade advisors, so we helped like uh, the industry, the core of the industries, down to nuts and bolts, and helping promote the, the British yard industry and uh, you know selling uh, equipment, and uh, but also all the way from that to promoting um, you know privatization of ports and looking at flagging issues. So helping out to flag a wild man was one of the areas that I worked intensely with in the five years that I was there. And it was uh, quite interesting and fascinating, I have to say. What were you actually doing to eliminate the issues? Well, it was, um, when it comes to, to sort of the... The, the more like uh, lobbying and uh, influencing role that we had there, it was a matter of like uh, creating awareness, creating awareness, for instance, of how the, the British flag and the, the flag of, uh, of uh, Isle of Man are not flags of convenience, but, you know, really solid uh, partners to have along. And that was a quite interesting process because it was, it was a new thing for most of the Norwegian ship owners then. And the, it was a good timing, for instance, on that issue because it was a time when the Norwegian fleet was still the third biggest in the world, but uh, there was so much changes happening all the time and, and it was so unpredictable and uh, that uh, it became a, a, a difficult situation to be flagged on the Norwegian flag. And uh, of course, we know for ship owners and ship operators, having the right flag, for instance, is one of the, the important matters. You need to know that it's uh, if you have steady conditions and foreseeable conditions for, for the time of the lifetime of the vessel. So that was a uh, good timing, and also privatization of ports was coming up as an issue back then. So that was that was trying to you know that was a matter of trying to get uh, the authorities along to open their eyes and mind to how a process like that could happen by uh, seeing examples and taking them along to to what was happening in the UK. Is that the first example of you working in in change within within the industry? I suppose that that must have been. It set you off on a path to, to get to you, where you are today, I suppose. It's a good point. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. And I, I it was, um, it was quite, so I thought it was quite an interesting role, definitely. And it was, uh, 
Uh, and I perhaps afterwards only now understand how much I learned and how much it gave me of uh, of kind of a ballast to understand the industry and, and understand the, the challenges that we're having and, the, you know, how the industry is, like you're saying, is changing. But of course, this is an industry that's kind of goes back thousands of years yeah. and uh, and of course always have been very international and it's been global in nature so it means that you know we this is uh, people who have know how to to handle cha- complex challenges all along so it's uh, it's something that gives me confidence that uh, the the future is fairly bright <laughs> for yeah. for the industry and us yeah Definitely, um, especially after these trying times. I think there's one thing mm-hmm. you can say is there's um, there's a, a lot of determined people within the, the marine industry. So mm-hmm. after you left um, the embassy, then you moved on to did you move to Singapore? Yeah, so there was a bit of a, a gap in between there where I worked with uh, pr- managing various projects in a completely different uh, sector and different things. Uh, and then ended up uh, working with a great Norwegian company who produces control systems and, and various equipment and uh, had the opportunity. I went to my boss one day and said, uh, you know, I sort of saw an opportunity in Asia and, and I went to my manager and said, uh, if you ever consider opening an office in Singapore, I would love to be considered for it. And he looked up at me and said, John, are you reading my mind? <laughs> so that was a good start, I suppose, to that process. And, and uh, a few months later, um, my stuff was packed and uh, we had a container packed of spare parts uh, for the company products. And, and off we went and uh, set up the business in Asia. What, what by, made you uh, pick Asia. Singapore? That was in Singapore, yeah. So that was what, eight what years. Made you, sorry, what made you choose Singapore? Yeah, well, it was kind of, um, even back in early 2000, I thought Asia was kind of the area where I saw the growth happening and saw kind of the core of the development of the future would be. So it, it had fascinated me for a long time. And um, I had some uh, friends who had already moved to Singapore and um kind of confirmed my thoughts that this this is the place where things are going to happen so you know I, I i could see that even though we things were quite okay there and uh, you know quite comfortable it it wasn't the same dynamics as i could see happening in asia and also i it was quite frustrating to see that there was lots of uh, then contracts happening at the shipyards here and happening at shipyards in asia that we lost out on because because of lacking presence so, yeah you know it's a, it's a matter of uh, having to be there and having to be able to to sort of get in a taxi and be at a, at a meeting half an hour later when when the customer says uh, jump yeah so that was um, a great opportunity so that's that's kind of why singapore was the natural choice and it's such a good it was clearly the place where the the growth was happening and the trade center was uh, happening so it depends a little bit on of course what part of the industry you, you're working with but it seemed quite clearly for the the marine services and maritime services uh this is the place to to be based yeah definitely yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, it makes it obviously such a dense place. So the amount of potential clients that you've got on your doorstep is, is, is much easier than being from uh, working from afar, I suppose. And then, so how how did things go? It was so that was with was that with IMS and Team Tech? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah it was. It went very well. I, I must say it was quite fantastic to see. I remember going uh, into uh, one of the biggest yards in Singapore where we, the company had never managed to get a contract and, and uh, you know, trying to, to sort of see f- how we can get in position. And, and it was uh, a, a process where they, they would uh, <clears throat> kind of fight back and say, well, we have our suppliers and mm-hmm. this is what we do. It. And, and um, it took me a year with uh, a fair bit of uh, legwork, literally legwork as well, walking around the yard, finding people who were working projects and and convincing them and tell you know educating them on on the products before we managed to to get in there. And thereon, we had all the contracts thereafter. So 
it worked. You know, it's it's a bit like the you know the classic sort of uh, one on one how to do business in Asia works, where you, you know you're either outside a circle or you're inside a circle. And it was an experience of that, I suppose, in in practice, where you kind of seen as an outsider is seen as unnecessary until you kind of have built strong enough relation to suddenly, uh, relationships to suddenly be part of the, the community and, and be part of the essential services, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, there's, there's a lesson in that for me there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. So after, I mean, so how was it four, just shy of five years that you worked with IMS and Team Tech? That's right, yeah. So were you, at this point, were you... Where, where were you in your head? Are you, are you, you gather, you, you strike me as someone that's um, ambitious and, and always wanting to push forward. What pushed you on from there? Were you, you seen things that were bigger? Were you, what, what was your, what was your thought process? Yeah, it was, um, it was a, it was kind of a, a challenging situation because they, uh, they wanted me back in Norway to work on new things there, whilst I felt that. Um, the, pro, the 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 challenge was that for me personally yeah then it would keep me safe and comfortable but it wasn't where the the industry is kind of developing and where the exciting uh, dynamics are so i um, and i chose to say goodbye and stay on in singapore right okay so that was, uh, of course, that was quite challenging because at the same time, you know, the oil, as we remember, the oil price was plummeting and our main market was uh, the offshore service vessels and offshore market, uh, the semi-submersibles and jack-up rigs and so on. And, and of course, that market was, was gone in, in a matter of months. And so, you know, having seen, having be, or being seen to sort of know that part of the market best, there was a huge surplus of uh, manpower here, so it was uh, it wasn't an easy period to to try to find uh, new projects and new things to work with. So I had already started a company in a completely different kind of segment, working with chemicals and so on. So sort of plodded on and worked with that until I finally found a, and a good challenge and a good role, um, taking on uh, the role in uh, in Jotron. Yeah, and that's uh, it's a very interesting uh, time in their history because they were also greatly affected by the the downturn in the offshore market. So they their big projects were not as plentiful anymore. So it was uh, largely it was a matter of uh, coming in to manage change in the organization. And that was uh, definitely a, a period where I learned a lot about how you can, how difficult it can be to come into an com- uh, organization where you have a strong culture. And uh, of course, everybody in the organization knew and were aware of the challenges that were happening and still, of course, resisting change, so, which is kind of, uh, it seems to be coming a core word as, uh, as our conversation is developing. Yeah, today, definitely, but- yeah. <clears throat> so that was my my main role, changing that organization to to be more fit for the future. So and downsizing and changing right. the, the the workforce to be more oriented on on the sales opportunities in the region and changing the way they were handling orders and the market. Right. Okay. And in, in what sense were you? Did you build out the the sales team, the marketing team? Did you? cut down other parts of it did you make it more agile what, what was your yeah precisely so you know the the if you look look at uh, how many products are being sold in the industry it's still a little bit of this left but you know if we go back to to at least when back in the days when i were young you know a traditional product offering in the mar in the marine industry a maritime industry would would sell through an agent in the market but and or you have distributors, you have all these like stock agents uh, handling your products, and and of course they 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 sit there and they take your products perhaps, but then they of course they will they will always sell whatever they make the most money on, and it's a bit like in the grocery industry in the olden days where you had distributors and and uh, wholesalers that was sort of in between the supermarkets and uh, and the producers. Yeah. So 
as the industry is changing, it makes much more sense to handle more of the market yourself. Uh, first of all, of course, you can you can control the supply chain much better. And one of the other things is that you get much more uh, feedback and knowledge about what products work, what products are beneficial, and what products are are wanted by the industry as things uh, change as well. Yeah. So it's much you can be much more agile, as you say, as to product development, and much more uh, user oriented when it comes to product development. Okay. So that's uh, that's uh, one of the some of the benefits that I, I saw with uh, going taking away some of the distributors and uh, the middlemen and handling the market uh, directly. It's a brave move, I suppose, at the time. Um, yeah. But as is any <laughs> as is any change, I suppose. And then, so from there, obviously, we're kind of getting into the, the last few years. Um, but one thing that so you've kept going, I believe, is your um, your own companies. Is this is this still the case? Yeah, true enough. Yeah, so you know, did a bit of this business development and market uh, or regional sort of uh, market mapping, uh, such as well for some companies, um, yeah. and um, and then went into a company that makes software and that was kind of the first time i suppose where i was uh, working with uh, specialized on on the maritime connectivity and uh, products that kind of fits into the connectivity like simple things i suppose like email and uh, cyber security and uh, and uh, handling cloud uh, for uh, for the data transfer from ship to shore but yeah. the, it gave me good knowledge and good uh, understanding of the connectivity challenge on uh, at sea, which definitely is um, an area where where there's uh, not that much uh, knowledge. It seems in the market, it's certainly something I experience today as a as a bit of a, a squeeze in the talent pool in the market <laughs> so the connectivity marine yeah, or yeah. maritime connectivity is definitely something i learn uh, a lot about uh, in my period in duologue and um, which i'm which is sort of one of the core issues that we are battling today in cortex because if yeah. our product is to be optimal for the industry it needs to be as lean as possible when it comes to data consumption yeah. Because it is still the fact that uh, for the vast majority of ships out there, connectivity is a challenge and every byte of data matters. Not possibly because you have a quota as such for many ships now, but because the bandwidth is so narrow that uh, operating daily communication takes up most of the, the capacity you have. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, not even... Just that, but the cost. I mean, it was, it, I, I had no idea, to be honest with you, until COVID struck. We, we had um, some mental health webinars on, and they were talking about obviously increased communications, but the the cost for the satellite um, communication is it's insane. It's, it's through the roof. But it's obviously, as you say, for companies, well, suppose we can bring in Cordex into it. And tell us a bit more about what you do and what the company does. Um, and then we can obviously we can cover the how the lean approach works for you guys. Yeah, well, just a quick comment on the on the cost uh, comment that you had there. So um, it's quite interesting though when you look at uh, how costs are seen in our industry. So if you have a ship manager and he has two options for for bunker, and there's a fifty thousand dollar difference on two options. He will just go with whatever is more convenient. But if you go to him and say, you need to spend $3,000 on a good VSAT connectivity per month, he will surely tell you that it that is impossible. That is way too much money to spend on connectivity. Yeah. And that mentality there is, is a challenge because uh, it really it needs to be seen as a as an essential thing to have good connectivity and good uh, hardware, good infrastructure on board, rather than seen as something extra or something uh, special or something fancy to have. It's a p essential part of how we operate our everyday life. 
So that's something uh, that I think uh, is still a challenge. I'm happy to discuss with any uh, people in the industry at any time. Yeah. But yeah, on to, on to Cordex. So we celebrated um, our first anniversary just some days ago. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's fantastic uh, to see that we made it here and what we have done in this one year. So we, we kicked off 1st of October last year. And um, we started off with a team of uh, somewhere about 20 people. Okay. And today we had uh, employee number 28 uh, join us. So it's a healthy little growth there. And um, when it comes to products, we also, in the meantime, we managed to, to uh, get our two sort of platforms and two core products out in the market, trademarked uh, our, our product names and we have managed to successfully install on 10 ships. So that's a good start. And um, data is coming in by the gigabyte every, well, every day actually. And um, the, now we have uh, a signing of co our first uh, fleet-wide contract coming in. Brilliant. It's, uh, well, it, I'm being a little bit uh, uh, ahead of myself there because it, <laughs> it's probably going to happen on Wednesday, but that's right. probably close enough to, for us to, to celebrate it already, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's fantastic. Is the, is the champagne still on ice, or has it been yeah, 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 we've already got it on ice, yeah, ready to <laughs> pop. <laughs> good, good to hear. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's, uh, and it's quite interesting to see also the industry reaction. So we we're trying to be as user centric as possible, and listen to uh, whoever we talk to, and we we're trying to talk to as many as possible now as to. Uh, what our products are yeah so it's it, it's you know we we thought early on that we needed to have a very wide product to make it but now we're seeing that what people really appreciate is that we're going deep on a very specific thing and our specific thing is monitoring and, uh, and therefore optimizing the operations of the main engine yeah. so one of the specific things for instance that that, that we uh, take on is the combustion. So you're looking at um, how efficient is the combustion? How well-tuned is the engine when it comes to injection, lubrication, exhaust, uh, airflow, um, uh, cooling, and um, you know uh, what torque do we produce compared to what the shop, tri and, uh, shop and trial tests are showing? And that, when it comes to down to this level, um, we don't see that many players that are, are working on it. Uh, so that's, that's, that's quite interesting, uh, I think. And, and I, I do start to understand also why not so many do it, but it, because it is quite hard. But we kind of have this ambition that we want to make the, the ship engine room into kind of the similar operation as to a Formula One car in the sense of having very good knowledge as to what goes on. Because yeah. it is, I mean, a good chief engineer and his uh, team, they will have a very good knowledge on how well the engine is doing and what kind of the health index of the engine is. And uh, with a trained eye and a trained ear, they can they can tell quite a lot of things of what's going on. But there are still uh, issues that um, is very hard or almost or actually impossible to detect. And um, we had an, a conversation with a ship owner some weeks ago where they, where they asked or well, said, told us that uh, they would have loved to know about our product a year ago, where they took over a ship, thought everything was good. It had just come out of dock. And um, when they uh, set out to sail across the Atlantic, two of the, of the cylinder liners uh, were, uh, or they, completely blue and uh, the whole engine had uh, was uh, stopped and they were adrift in the Atlantic and uh, the whole repair and demurrage and everything came to $800,000 right and when you have those kind of incidents of course then of course uh, having a, a tool that helps you to to see the insides of the engine and being able to tell the actual conditions of it is is extremely valuable, so that's not of course that's a that's a 
not everyday ex- occurrence, but it's basically about helping the team on board have the best possibility to, to do the right things at the right time. But it's also to help them communicate with the, the shore team as, as to what problems they're having and for the shore team to plan well as to what maintenance they need, what spare parts they need in what port, but also about how and what they need to do for uh, a dry docking, for instance, instead of having to take the engine apart or having to do an inspection on the cylinder liner, you you may be able to say, well, no, we can take another charger and we can do another round trip somewhere yeah. uh, instead of uh, having to do maintenance early in the, in the interval that you have. So that kind of thing, it really is an enabler to, to do the best in the market. So that's what we're doing and uh, that's what uh, we feel that we're, we're really becoming quite specialised on. Brilliant. So essentially that is, for, for laymen like myself, that be, you're looking at it and the, using the Internet of Things, send, uh, am I correct in saying that you, the chief engineers on board can have access to the data as well as the shore-based teams? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and then, then are you just looking for like- in the engine and the, the combustion that yeah. may determine issues or problems and then be able to run the, the vessel much more efficiently. Exactly. Right, okay. So, you know, avoiding breakdowns, avoiding the off-fires, uh, making sure that you use the, the parts of the engine to the optimal length and, uh, of course, save a fair bit of fuel along the way. Yeah, I was just going to say. That's quite useful. <laughs> So what, I mean, um, in, term, in terms of the first, the, so obviously the 10 ships have been working with, do you have ideas of the, the savings, the potential savings then that you can make even just in fuel efficiencies alone? Yeah, sure, we have. So, I mean, in theory, a normal ship engine will have something like a 50% efficiency. And in theory still, it should be possible to bring it up to something like 65%. Okay. But we believe that it's quite safe to assume that we should, with a bit of knowledge and a bit of uh, um, experience under our wings, should bring this to 5% at least. So, you know, quite immediately when we started testing and just doing like simple tests and simple uh, experiments on board, we see a 1.5% saving on fuel and uh, uh, therefore, of course, uh, 1.5% saving on, on CO2 emissions as well, which is yeah. another issue that is quite useful to to look at here. Yeah, of course, yeah. That's great. I mean, 1.5% is 1.5%, but for a, a large fleet owner, that's that's a... That's incredible saving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you can save it, let's say for a, a fairly sizable ship, you can save a ton of fuel a day. Right. That's uh, That adds up to money in the end. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, okay, brilliant. I mean, so where do you see, so Cordex, you're a year old, looking back, first year, I mean, that's that's quite an incredible year. And it's quite an incredible return considering everything's happened. Um, what, six months in? Or not, not even six months in, I suppose. It was three, two months in, three months in where, when COVID kicked in. Has yeah. that, has that been quite a, I mean, how, how much of a challenge has that been for, for your business? We've been, we've been trying to see it as a, you know, as positive as possible. And it has given us, a, it, I mean, it has given us an opportunity to focus on that product and uh, solely on that. So instead of uh, having to, to focus on expanding and getting more deployments done and more ships in our, uh, on our system, we have just purely sort of stopped that and thought, okay, we're just going to focus on getting the products right, getting them better and being ready for the market as things opening up again. But of course, it, it it is troublesome. I mean, we're lucky to be, as we talked about earlier in the in the chat here about Singapore being such a hub. It is yeah. great to have some of these uh, ten ships regularly calling at Singapore, yeah. meaning that we can do you know some tweaks, some upgrades, some changes, and go on board and see how things are doing. 
So that's, that's been very helpful and also other ships coming in that we are planning on deploying on now that we're getting the contract. So you can do the audit and so on. That helps tremendously. But like right now, we have we had one service engineer who was going to a ship in Turkey at the dry dock there. And uh, he only made it there on Saturday. And today he was told that the ship is sailing tomorrow and he still has loads of work to do. Because yeah. it took him, it took him three weeks to get a permit to leave his uh, country. Right. So it's it, of course th- there's no doubt that this is a, it is a big problem for for us and for everyone in this industry. And it is uh, one of the other aspects is that is that uh, we are recruiting quite regularly. And uh, recruiting for some of these roles is uh, is quite hard in the first place because you're looking at uh, roles where there are quite few uh, people in the world that kind of fits the profile that we ideally would like to have. Yeah. And when you can't move people <laughs> from one country to another that easily anymore, it becomes a challenge, definitely. Uh, in addition to that, I mean, we, we, we're still predominantly working uh, remotely here, yeah. but um, it's uh, nevertheless uh, the fact that we do want people to be here because we, in Singapore, because we, we have a living lab in process and we have a, a lab in the office as well, that we, where we're constantly running projects and we're constantly learning and we're constantly, uh, you know, investigating new possibilities. So it's uh, necessary to kind of uh, be here one way or another. So that's challenging. <laughs> yeah, we, it's not it's not going to be a quick fix. Um, but I think the, there's so many people in the industry that would have, would have experienced something similar with new technology coming along, new um, new propulsion systems, etc. When they're trying to then find people, the 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 ideal scenarios to find people with experience which is a very small pool. Um, people with experience in the maritime industry with experience with the internet of things and connectivity. And yeah, of course, that's a, a very small pool. Or how do you think you can go about solving that? Yeah, it's, it's quite, yeah, that is definitely a challenging thing. So, you know, either you find people who have good, uh, for instance, IoT or AI experience, but they may not have uh, any experience or, or knowledge about the connectivity challenge that we have and um, how to work around that or any other marine or maritime industry and uh, experience, which might be fine, but ideally, of course, you want someone who can understand what we're looking at and at least understand uh, what the complex system is on board and and how we we work with technology on that. But it is it's going to take some time before we have the, the talent pool there. And, and it is requiring us to be a little bit creative in the sense of looking at parallel industries. Like, of course, at the moment, there are some uh, some opportunities to look at aviation, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Which, unfortunately, of course, is, is having a very tough time. And uh, uh, that, that can help us uh, a little bit uh, as well. And there is, a, there is, of course, and I think this is uh, quite positive, that uh, there is, I see that there is a fair bit of interest to join the maritime industry. It's perhaps not seen as, um, uh, as quite as backward and difficult anymore as it, uh, I perhaps it appeared, uh, or perhaps it appeared earlier. So that, that's uh, helpful as well. There's a curiosity there, and there's a positive attitude there. To uh, to joining the our uh, realms, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think there's 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 so much more being done. Well, I I, I don't I, I can't I can't say what, what happened in the past, um, but obviously just personal experience. But it seems like there's there's much more of a, an effort for diversity um, across so so many authorities uh, within within the maritime industry. There's diversity, new skills, um, and, and obviously going into a digitalization era i mean we can touch on that i think that's quite a it's quite a, it's, it's very poignant with, with what's going on do you think that there's digitalization as a whole for the maritime industry do you think there's enough support there um for companies like yourself to to come into the market do you think there's enough understanding 
or do you think that there's the with the the large concept projects that you've you, people have either been involved in or you've heard about not for Cordex, sorry, but just in general, obviously autonomous ships. I think we spoke about it before. Do you think that there has to be a bridge and there has to be more support for, for yourselves? Yes and no, in a way. So yes, the, <clears throat> there is, um, there's a fair bit of uh, support going on. I think there's a lot of uh, good initiatives being taken. We see, for instance, how MPA and the authorities in Singapore um, uh, promoting startups and promoting technology to programs like the Peer 71, right. which is very helpful and very good. Uh, we have other start, uh, startup accelerators and pitch contests and so on, such as the Captain's Table in Hong Kong uh, and Startup Wharf in London and so on. And, and that's, that's great initiatives, some of them private driven as well and uh, driven by you know idealist people which is fantastic but of course yeah it's um, still for instance some investment resilience in uh, maritime technology because of it being uh, seen as having perhaps a more difficult path than that you would see in other tech uh, avenues and of course b2b in itself is a little bit more tricky than b2c and uh, also within the maritime versus some other parts uh, or some other industries, it's uh, it's seen as a, a harder path to be on. So definitely that means that uh, uh, money sits a bit tighter yeah, and that doesn't help at all. And uh, of course, when it comes to, to uh, re-educating and helping people to perhaps change trajectory in their career, that also needs a bit of nudging. And I see in Singapore, there are good initiatives happening on that as well. But of course, it's um, at the same time, there is a lot of uh, change happening. There's a, there's a definitely a, a huge revolution as such. But, you know, turning a, a VLCC around is uh, it's not something done in a minute or two. It takes time and, and it takes time to, for this industry to also to, to be for it to be visible how much of a change is happening and I think that's important to keep in mind yeah so, uh, like I mentioned to you some other time was that I'm a bit sick of these conference programs when they're talking about how much we need uh, a change in the industry and we need digitalization and something needs to happen because it, it kind of doesn't it fails to recognize that all the changes happening that, that all the serious players are taking be it uh, the big uh, ship management companies and ship management in itself is changing quite uh, tremendously and, and ship owners, the structure of owners is uh, changing somewhat as well, but they, they are doing a great job, I think. And it's not easy, you know, if, as, if you're a ship owner today and you want to build a new ship, you are building a ship I'm putting it a little bit uh, uh, to the extreme here, but you're basically building a ship that only is going to serve its purpose for half its normal lifetime. So rather than a ship sailing for 20 years, it can only do 10 now because it won't meet IMO 2030 uh, regulations. Yeah. To, to put it a bit pointedly, you know, but yeah. that's, that's what you're looking at. So it's, it is a challenge and it's not easy then to to sort of take a gamble on uh, things to work out. But of course, that's what our industry is good at as well, to yeah. take a somewhat calculated risk. <laughs> <laughs> taking, a, taking a little bit of faith. You mentioned um, um, almost a reflection of the industry. I think, I, th I think this is perfect as well for the time that we're in. Um, there's so many more businesses, so many more businesses. Let's, let's be honest. Most of the world is is operating in a um, a, a very much data driven way. Um, and then looking at that, looking at the, the our industry and, and saying if it doesn't, if people don't adopt it and they, they don't realise what's coming round, it's all, it almost seems like a no brainer. But you. You gave a, a good reflection before we started recording of the um, in the 1870s in Norway, but if you wouldn't mind sharing that, I think this is this is amazing. This is brilliant. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's important to to sort of learn from 
what has happened before as well and and we're sitting in the same similar situation today like um, you know how important is it to change so so as i mentioned briefly in my hometown riso it was a, the biggest flag port in the under the norwegian flag in the 1870s well maybe the second but okay big enough and uh, all the ships there were wooden ships and there were sail ships and at the same time in the world, of course, the, the maritime world was turning to steam and steel hulls. So there was a, it was a bit of discussion among the ship owners back home where they were talking about, you know, do we change? Shall we go uh, with this uh, trend that we're seeing and change to steel hulls, get some steam engines? And, um, and the consensus was no, of course not. It is a no-brainer. Uh, you can't you can't operate a steamship as cheap as you can do with a sail ship. Of course, yeah. wind is free and coal is is expensive. So it makes absolutely no sense to pay for fuel when you can get it for free. So they went with their uh, sail ships, and needless to say, fifty years later, all the ship owners there were gone. Yes, it's incredible to think of looking back from from where we sit right now. It, you can't you can't actually believe that that would have been the case, but you can mm. understand their point of view. But at the same point, it's like, well, it's it's quicker. It gets things there, and the difference between then and what's that, hundred and hundred and fifty years time. You're expecting things daily. You, you expect everything now rather than weeks. Well, yeah. yeah, incredible. Yeah, exactly. What do you think and the the drivers are for change now? Then what, what's yeah, we we actually we we had a, a whole uh, day looking at this uh, with our team some weeks ago, looking at what are the change drivers and trying to sort of forget about what industry we are in, but just looking in in general in society. And uh, of course, uh, there are some things that we can recognize in our industry as well. Environmental awareness is definitely one of the change drivers. And we see that in our industry as well. I um, mean, the interest for introducing a bunker levy and the IMO 2030 regulations is one thing, but it's going to be regional regulations and regional requirements for, for what kind of ships we have, but also industry-driven uh, changes. Like we see already pharmaceutical company, uh, in pharmaceutical companies saying that they only will take shipments from uh, companies that can deliver in a sustainable way. And uh, so the charterers are going to start to drive a change as well for us. And that that's definitely a huge factor. Uh, the opportunity to, uh, to use technology, uh, in particular IoT and um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, we believe, is uh, two of the other change drivers that will definitely have a big impact. Uh, the energy, the change in energy use in itself is uh, something that is a forced driver, perhaps, but it's definitely a very interesting uh, trend where we, we don't really know how a ship engine in 20 years from now will look or a B, or what will drive it for the the big, uh, uh, you know, uh, deep sea vessels. But we know it's going to be something different from what we have at the moment, even with the, the dual full technologies that we see being installed on ships today. So that's definitely another considerable change driver. Yeah, I mean, I have some. I've had some interesting conversations recently with them. Um, People either ETOs on the um, well, some of the some of the new gas ships, and essentially everything's everything's automated. Any any issues, it comes down to it comes down to them from flushing the toilet to obviously propelling the vessel. So it's it's a, it's you can just see how uh, one of my next questions it was going to be: What do you think the potentials are for, or the potential is sorry for, or, or the areas that it can impact within? either owning a vessel or running a vessel. I know you guys, obviously, your, your first couple of products are there, but where do you, where does it stop? Where do you see the potential being limited at the present moment? Well, one of the, one of the sort of the wanted change, perhaps, by a lot of the technology providers 
for the maritime industry is towards autonomous vessels. And we see numerous projects within this, either uh, by, um, uh, by Rolls-Royce, uh, ABB, Kongsberg, and so on. And Wurzela as well, of course. And that's, that of, I, I do see that that is something happening and that's something that requires a lot of tools and help. But having said that, I certainly believe that the human uh, sailor is definitely fairly safe and I will still have a place in the future. And I, I've written an article previously on why we will never see unmanned vessels in our lifetime. And one of the parallels I, I'd like to take there is that the first autonomous flight across the Atlantic was made in 1947. So all the way from takeoff, flight, and landing was done purely by machines. But still, we would never fly from New York to London without a human pilot today. So it means that you know we, we haven't taken a, that element, even though it's, it's a very uh, unnecessary <laughs> cost and unnecessary uh, technology as such. But we still we still put our trust in human beings, and I think that's going to be the same thing on ships. So, but it's about helping and empowering the crew on board, and we already, of course, see the trend of having less crew. So, a, a ship today has considerable less crew than what it did twenty years ago or thirty years ago. Yeah, and uh, that change will continue to happen. We will definitely have ships with less crew in the future as well. And that crew need to do more. And for instance, at the moment, we see that the crew are spending way too much time uh, logging things, looking for information, sending reports, uh, operations that are completely unnecessary. Right. So that's one element that's definitely going to change, being able to for them to focus on important matters and important jobs. Um, and of course, then being able to empower them, for instance, when it comes to us and Cordex, it's about being able to operate the, this expensive and sophisticated machinery without having a, a full crew on board as we have today, but being able to, to know what's uh, the challenge, what's going on, being able to do adjustments and, and uh, preempt, uh, you know, predictive and also preventive maintenance on the engine that's going to be extremely important. And that engine will probably be running on one or other type of combustion, I believe, for quite a while. We're not going to take out fully the combustion engine for, for the foreseeable future, I believe. And the foreseeable future being perhaps 10 years, let's say. Yeah. So, so it's going to be LNG. It's going to be some sort of uh, dual fuel and also hydrogen. Definitely uh, going to be a, a big player in this as well as we get um, a bit more mature on that technology. Yeah, hydrogen and ammonium. Incredible. If that, I mean, if that can, if that can come to fruition, that's well. Obviously, as you say, it's, it's some some way away. But yeah. Amazing. Well, we we'll get to this point. Well, obviously, we're not far from from the end. But there's just a couple of wee questions I'd like to to end the the podcast on. Um, and one of them um, is going to be your influences. Where where do you take your your inspiration from? Is it books? Do you have mentors? Any, anything in particular, or anyone? I, I certainly think there's a mix of in, uh, influences for myself and for, for the company as such as well. Okay. It's, um, we definitely, in, we do talk a lot about uh, how we see um, things being solved in parallel industries. And uh, we see, for instance, in, um, I did mention Formula One being one uh, thing earlier, uh, yeah. how you know you have the extreme performance there and the extreme sort of use of data and I, I definitely feel that that is very uh, applicable and very user uh, usable for us to take across of course we have a very different take on time when it comes to to the marine industry and we we don't have to 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 work at the thousands of a second yeah but still being able to take those and good and insightful decisightful decisions when it matters is is very useful 
and personally i do feel that i i get inspired by people who who try to challenge the system because a lot of the innovation we see is innovation to survive we see we're doing things differently because we we see a need to so we we change from we change from for instance a normal bicycle to to having a, an electric scooter uh, because it's it's you know there's a little bit better but it still serves a very similar purpose but if you look at uh, technology and innovation not to survive but to win is a matter of looking back at the whole process and how we argue and discuss and challenge why and how we do things all together so, for instance, instead of making a digital bill of lading, is there a way of uh, doing a completely different process of handling the, the purposes of the bill of lading? Yeah. So that, that, that kind of question, you know. So I would say, for instance, Elon Musk, it is all uh, not as a person, but for what he's doing is definitely quite interesting in the sense that, you know, he's challenging how we use energy to to get around and and how we um, harvest energy by doing different type of you know why do we have a big roof without it producing something for us for instance yeah of course yeah <clears throat> i think that's quite uh, quite interesting to find, see these people who who kind of not just change how we do things but uh, completely why we do things well, that's that's a, a good that's a good way to go. I think the F one. It's a, I, I can't really foresee them being able to do a dry docking in four seconds. But I, so I get what you mean by time. Um, but yeah, it's it's incredible to see. I suppose the advancements are made in these parallel industries are only going to assist the, the maritime industry um, and and companies like yourself be able to to push, and as well as just the the acceptance within. Um, the individual um, of, of a willingness to change because they can see it within different things, even within the, the most the most prominent sport in the world, football. Everything's gone down to data. Everything's yeah. the, the analytics of, of of performance within the human is is never mind going going to ships and going to um, engine efficiencies and stuff. So it's definitely it's a massive change, and it's it's good. It's exciting to see. It's great to. I mean, I think when we first spoke, I, was, I just find it exciting to be honest, speaking to people like yourself and and hearing about the change that companies are, are the companies are out there and, and what they can do and what they can bring to the market. Um, but last last question is um, is more of a personal one, um, and it's your first vessel, your first experience with a ship. Um, it might have been as a kid, but it might have been as an adult. What, what's your, if you can think of one, what what can you think of? Well, when I was a kid, I was extremely fascinated by a ship and I, I read everything I could about right. the building of it, the, the use of it and the history of it. And I was the Titanic. Uh, as far as ship goes, that was a very sad story, though. But um, from a technical perspective, she was uh, quite a lady. That was a fantastic construction on it. And uh, later in my life, of course, I, one of the products I worked with in IMS was watertight sliding doors. And, and Titanic was the very first ship in the world with uh, watertight sliding doors. And they actually worked. That was, uh, it was just a minor flaw with that is that they had, um, they didn't have ventilation, proper ventilation systems back then. So the, the watertight doors worked, but the, the walls between the watertight compartments were not built all the way up to the, the the deck or the roof so therefore uh, when water reached a certain level it just spilled over into the next compartment right it kind right. of made it uh, a bit of a problem when it came to the situation she was in but yeah uh, you know the whole um, uh, construction of her at Harlan Wolf and uh, the story of building such a glorious uh, uh, construction I think is uh, fascinating and perhaps that was a uh, one of the inspirations for getting into this industry uh, without me even realizing it. 
But so every day, every time I go on a ship, still I am super excited, and uh, I I love uh, just getting into the engine room and uh, uh, up on the bridge and uh, like feeling uh, you know experiencing what a what a fantastic uh, achievement it is to to build these structures. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. No, it's it's incredible. Uh, I think my my first one was. Um, the Waverley, it's uh, no, actually, I tell a lie, it was the uh, HMS Plymouth. Oh, yes, that's was, a good ship, man. yeah, but yeah, but it's, it's, it's incredible, it is absolutely incredible. Um, I think we're all we're all lucky to be involved, and definitely. But, um, before we go, is, is if anyone's listened to this, and by the way, I'll forward you a link. So, Harlander Wolf, the company that own that bought them last year, it's um, Infrastrata. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've done a podcast with um, John Wood, the CEO. So I'll, I'll send you a link to to that. Um, if it might, there may be some stories in there that, that interest you with the Titanic. Um, but yeah, for anyone that's been listening, that's that's interested, and wants to get in touch, either learn more about Cordex or just get in touch with yourself. What's what's the best way? That is uh, quite simple. Write an email to futurewith at cordex dot co, as in C O. Okay, so future with at cordex.co. John, it's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate your time. Um, uh, I hope that it's been entertaining for, for others listening, and I hope it's, um, well, I, ho- I hope you've enjoyed it. So thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for a good chat. Cheers. So that was episode two. A massive thanks to, to John for taking the time to join us. Um, for me, it was it was great to, to get to know a bit more about the man as well as obviously Cordex. They're, they're a, a great company and um, let's be honest, uh, the toughest market conditions that most of us are likely to see in our lifetime, they've went, f- they've, they've, they've basically just started and they've went from strength to strength. Massive congratulations to them for f- signing up their, their, their first fleet size contract. Um, obviously when it was recorded, that hadn't been released yet but it has now so great to hear um, and, and likewise with the, the first podcast if you haven't listened to it we interviewed John Wood the CEO of Infrastrata from Harland and Wolf and they, both companies are, are inspiring in, in such trying times um, and it's important that we all take stock and move forward and take the inspiration where we can so yeah great great to hear the story and I hope you enjoyed it Um and if you haven't already, please like, subscribe and share um, and we'll, we'll keep this moving. Hopefully every week we can bring you inspirational guests. But thanks again for listening. Uh, this is Gordon Rennie and this has been the Port to Port podcast. <laughs>